Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. I have the great privilege to, uh, to meet with today and to have a conversation today with a person who I've known for a very long time. She grew up in Chicago, went to Ida Crown for high school, but most importantly, she is a person who has really made a difference in this world. The Isle Eckstein is the president and the CEO of the International Fellowship for Christians and Jews, an a organization that was founded by her late father, Rabbi Yechiel Eckstein, and she continues to help millions of people through her efforts. Literally 2.1 million Jews were helped this past year because of the efforts of the International Fellowship, of the International Fellowship. And Yael, thank you so much for giving me your time today. I'm honored. Thank you so much, Rabbi Matanki. So let's get started right away. The International Fellowship, you gave me a little bit of uh, background in the course of a year. How much money is raised to help the Jewish community? Well, it started, as you know, around 40 years ago with the dream of my father. And back then it was, he would talk about like every $25 check that he would get, he would, you know, be excited about and be able to help people with. Um, when he died in 2019, uh, we were raising $114 million. And three years later now, thank God this year, we're uh, raising around $250 million from 670,000 donors. Wow. And the donors are almost all non-Jewish. They're almost all Christian donors. Why do they give to causes that involve Jews, that help Jews? It's a great question. And I think one that has been discussed in so many ways, I'm sure we'll be talking about it this evening or evening here, afternoon there. Um, but uh, in short, and you know, you could give hour long seminars on this, um, but the evangelical Christians went back to what you would call their roots, that they study the Tanakh, they study the Torah, and everything in the Torah is about, you know, the, any evangelical Christian will quote you Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless Israel and curse those that curse Israel, that they want to be part of this blessing. And as we read the Nevi'im, we see from 2000 years ago, over 2000 years ago, that um, the Jewish people will return to Israel, will settle here, that this is um, the words of our forefathers coming to life, especially now we're in the Parshat Lech Lecha, wherever I'm picked up and moved to Israel, um, that is happening all over again in the vision of the prophets that the Christian community who um, read these words and believe them want to be part of it. And so they want to be part of, of the rebuilding of the Jewish state because it's part of the prophetic vision. They have a PS to it that we don't really uh, jump on. Their PS is part of the prophetic version. We'll take it beyond what we believe is Mashiach. Does that create a problem for people? That uh, it's No, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. It's a great question. One that people ask me very, very often. I think that, you know, in my 18 years working with the fellowship, I started off putting stamps on the envelopes and um, just learned everything from my father and saw what he did and thought it was amazing to help the Holocaust survivors and bring Jews and Aliyah and all the different areas, build bomb shelters when there are war in Israel, um, helping Jews in the former Soviet Union, that everything I saw, I, I, I wanted to be part of this. And the Jewish community would always ask me, but don't Christians give so that, you know, Jesus will come and it will be Messiah and it will be revealed as Jesus. I personally in 18 years have maybe heard three or four donors bring it to that place. Um, they're Christian, so I'm sure that's what they believe. But is that the motivating factor? Not that I've seen. What I've seen the motivating factor is simply to be part of this story. And the biggest um, motivation, I would say, is Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those that bless Israel, curse those that curse people, Israel. And also, a lot of our donors are older. They're over 70, 80 years old. That they... Um, saw the establishment, many of them, the state of Israel, they remember, many of them are in their 80s or 90s, they remember when Israel was established, they lived through the Holocaust and remember that. So with all of the anti-Semitism, with all of the history of the Jewish and Christian communities, they want to make a statement of we stand with Israel and not standing with Israel through um, a Christian organization, but 
Dafka, specifically standing with Israel through the fellowship, who uh, my father, Zichon Bracha, was an Orthodox rabbi, that it was very known, obviously, no evangelizing or anything like that, that it was Jews distributing the aid to Jews that the Christians donated. And now that um, now that I'm taking over to the point that our chairman, the chairman of our board, who's one of our biggest donors, Bishop Lanier, uh, he's Christian, obviously, has a big church. And he said, if it was ever not an Orthodox Jew leading this organization, I would stop giving because that's the whole message that we want to give, we want to help, and we that's it. Our in our involvement stops there. I, the comment you made just a moment ago about it's being an older population who are donating, does that concern you that the younger Christian community don't necessarily buy into the miracle of the birth of the state of Israel? Uh, Rabbi Matanki, I think everything scares me these days <laughs> with what's happening around the world. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing in the Jewish and Christian community that so much of the younger generation is not as educated, involved, passionate, committed to Israel. Um, and it's definitely scary. But also what we've seen is there's something about this older age that people kind of return to those values of their parents, of their grandparents. So a lot of the polls are being taken on college campuses that show um, the younger generation not involved. And I think one of the one of the characteristics of being in college is rebelling and thinking different than your parents, thinking different than the way you were raised. And all the data that I've seen shows that by the time they're, they, that their um, associations or pet projects or what they care about are constantly changing until they're 30 years old. Once they hit 30 years old, that's the time that their values are pretty much formulated. And uh, very often you see from third year old onward, going back to the values of their parents. So it's definitely scary what's happening with the young generation. I think it's time for all of us that care to kind of wake up, do whatever we can to change this trend. But the data that I'm seeing from college campuses, I don't think necessarily represent what will be for these same individuals when they hit their older years. And what are the causes that speak to this Christian community the most? resettlement from FSU, from the former Soviet Union? What other topics, what other ish causes do they like to support? Well, the fellowship is really focused in three different areas. All of them that are, you could say, biblical or prophetic. One of them is Aliyah, and Aliyah from uh, Ukraine, from Russia, from Ethiopia, from um, all across the world. We focus mostly on non-Western countries, just because the Western countries generally speaking, are able to make Aliyah if they want to. It's not the finances that are holding them back from buying a plane ticket. Um, so we focus on non-Western countries. And then um, uh, Bitachon, which is security, which is, you know, uh, there are so many different uh, biblical verses of protecting the people of Israel. Um, so we've built over 5,500 bomb shelters, distributed numerous um, uh uh, bulletproof ambulances and security vehicles, um, fire trucks, everything in the area of security we're, we're involved in. And uh, of course, the area of poverty, which is, you know, the, the basics that I think when you read, um, when, when you read the Torah, you see kind of this focus on basic needs that what's the idea of staka and charity. Um, it doesn't talk so much about like buying new computers or giving scholarships, of course, that's wonderful. But when you go back just kind of to the bare minimum, bare basics, it's all about helping the elderly, making sure they have food, making sure they have medicine. So that's, those are the three areas that the fellowship is involved in. And how do you reach out to this community, to the Christian community? Is it, uh, I saw on your resume that you've been a guest on the 700 Club with Gordon Robertson, and it's like a classic um, Christian Christian television show. Are you finding yourself a lot on television? Is it uh, personal appearances? What What do you think is the way you're really succeeding in growing the organization and growing its support? So there's an amazing system that my father set up of direct response that we're able to reach out to the masses um, in a personalized way and reach them where they're at. So our biggest area is television, direct mail, um, internet, social media. I have a podcast um, that all these areas of direct response where we can reach out to the masses with our mission and vision and um, showing them what we're doing and giving them the opportunity to help is an area that we're involved in. 
And when they reach back, first of all, anyone, if Yael looks familiar and you didn't grow up in Chicago knowing the Eckstein family, it's because you've gone to Israel and you see her picture whenever you're going on the way from the airplane into the airport. There's a beautiful picture of her father waving as he's coming off the plane, and Yael is in another picture as well. The fellowship is there as soon as you walk into Israel. Do you bring um, the Christian donors to Israel to see what they've done, or is it more a little bit at a distance because you're dealing with simpler, uh, less affluent people? It's a great question, and it's changed throughout the years. We have to. We used to have something called the Journey Home Tour that once a year we would bring uh, one or two buses to Israel. Um, now we have a situation that was before Christian tourism was so mainstream, and now in Israel we have around 4 million tourists to Israel a year, and around 2.2 million of them are actually Christian. And so um, when my father passed away and we kind of had to refocus and see where we were going to go, what we were going to do, if we were going to survive uh, past that first generation. Um, one of our main focuses was staying uh, within the area that we're most needed and not moving into other areas where there are already others. And the area of Christian tourism is already so um, flooded um, and, and we weren't needed. So we moved out of the area of Christian tourism, and we really just focus on these pure humanitarian staka programs. Um, but that being said, last week, for the first time in 40 years ever, we brought our US and Canada board members to Israel to tour the projects. And it was incredible. We have a board member who joined in 1985, and she's never been to Israel. Um, and it's, uh, you know, Orthodox, yeshiva, rabbi from Toronto, hand in hand with a pastor from America, um, Christians, Jews coming together to see uh, the work of the fellowship on the ground. And it's something that in general, this was unique to the board coming together, because in general, um, what my father built, which is, you know, very smart, very needed, and, and definitely um, continuing, is that there's no connection between our donors and the recipients, that, you know, the donors give their funds, it's distributed by our Israel office um, to the recipients, and there isn't a direct connection between them. So being able to have our board members who understand, and all the red lines are obviously very clear, understanding the uh, theology and sensitivities and of uh, the opposite religion, Jews, Christian, um, it was an amazing thing just to have this group together to really tackle these difficult issues in an area in Israel <laughs> that was focused only on respect and appreciation for one another. Fascinating. Now, one of the other things you mentioned to me earlier before we started was that you have offices in four countries, the United States, Canada, and Israel, I understand right away. But the fourth country was Korea, which I find amazing that of all the countries in the world, the other country you pick is Korea. Why Korea? Well, Korea has a very quickly growing Christian community. Um, the truth is, there are a lot of area, a lot of countries that do. You could look at Brazil, um, which we were we we were open and considering, but we had to really focus and see what was the most um, uh, realistic in order to grow quickly. Uh, you could look at China; there are 100 million Christians in China. So there are so many areas around the world, countries and regions that are growing in the in in Christians, um, and we look at that as an opportunity, like what you were talking about earlier of this next generation that's not as engaged in Israel, it's not as involved and educated in Israel, um, that we look, really look at that as our area of expertise, of both how to engage, involve, educate, and to really focus it on this area of basic needs. So um, I think one of the most brilliant things my father did actually was made the organization apolitical, non-political, I should say. And so we never get involved. Our donors call us before every single election in America, for example, and say, who's the best candidate for Israel. And we say we don't get involved there. In Israel, we work with any government that's elected. We've worked with many different ones in the Ministry of Welfare and, and others. Um, and so it's really just this, um, you know, it used to be that Israel was a bar bipartisan issue that you could say, we our only mission is supporting Israel and we're non-political. Today, when I say that people are like, well, you realize what you just said is political. Standing with Israel has become political. Um, and so I, I think it shows where the world has gone, but even within that, yes, we 
unapologetically proudly stand with Israel, but we take no political position. So in areas like Korea or Brazil or China even, um, uh, there's an opportunity right now as so many people are finding Christianity to uh, teach them about this fundamental connection between their faith and Israel. And in many of these countries, it's actually first generation Christians, that um, if we don't go and build that bridge, if we don't teach them the direct connection between it, then no one else is going to. And it's not like in America, where um, you have these associations that, okay, if you're evangelical Christian, you stand with Israel, this is new turf, that just as easily these Christians could, God forbid, be anti Semitic, or, you know, formulate a different philosophy, connection, relationship with the Jewish community in Israel. So um, we feel very driven and drawn to go specifically into Korea, where there's a very um, high population of Christians, first or second generation. Uh, it's a free country, so we're able to freely work there. Um, and people are interested. They want to know. They want to learn. So do you get a pushback from the Christian community being, why are you taking funds from the Christian community to use for the Jewish community? Or is it quiet or is it what happens there it's a it's a really good question so one of the things is that we're grassroots so on one hand we're huge but on the other hand we're grassroots we're not working with like these mega churches or big public figures or we're working with lots and lots 670,000 individuals who are giving $25 a month who are giving $40 a month to bring a food packs um and so we, uh, we, we don't, we haven't had, I mean, there's always people I think maybe who have issues with everything, but nothing that's been substantial or public or anything that has gotten to me at all. Now you did, I remember early on, there was a lot of pushback from the yeah. Jewish community. Has that quieted down? Yeah, in a in a huge way, thank God. Um, I think for a few reasons. I think that um, all new ideas are scary, and you have to see where they go, and what are the boundaries, and what are the red lines, and what's going to happen with this. And especially, the only thing the Jewish community knew about the Christian community was what we learned in the history books. I think it's completely legitimate that the Jewish community had the reservations. Um, it was new and it was scary. Uh, my father built very, very clear communication, red lines, um, education for the Christian community of why you don't evangelize to Jews, of when they say certain things, why we find that offensive, that I think my father really led the way to bring us where we are today. And where we are today is that I think for... Um, uh, for a few reasons. One of them is political. We're not involved in political, uh, in the political discussion, but you see that politically Christians have been Israel's greatest friends as far as moving the um, embassy to USMC to Jerusalem, or recognizing the Golan Heights, or standing behind uh, the cancellation of the Iran deal, um, that the Christian community has always, no matter who's been in power, just been a voice for Israel. So I think the Jewish community recognizes that. The second thing is I think the fellowship now, you know, like we said, all ideas are, all new ideas are scary because you don't know where it's going to be. You don't know where it's going to go. Um, but by now we have 40 years of uh, history that you could look and say, you know, obviously there's never been one situation of evangelizing. We, we draw very clear uh, boundaries between our donors and recipients. And actually we've led to this area of education and engaging Christians on Israel that's manifested in politically standing with Israel, even if we're not directly involved or tourism to Israel, even if we're not directly doing tourism. Um, and so I think it's become a lot less scary to the Jewish community and uh, to the point where there, I don't think there's any organization or Israeli business that's not targeting the Christian community to try to engage them. I, I still remember when um, the Jewish agency gave the fellowship a seat at the table because of all of the work that was being done, which was at the time somewhat unusual. I don't, the, you were the first uh, organization of, the, of that nature that received the seat at the table on the board of governors of the Jewish agency. Have there been other formal parts of the Israeli community that have also welcomed you in as a formal member? Um, well, the truth is, I feel, you know, I think a lot of times when people experience um, 
uh, criticism and hardship. My father was brought to the Beit Din. He was almost put in Cherem. I mean, he was, you know, studying Dafyomi every morning and an Orthodox yeah. rabbi, Lusmicha from Rav Soloveitchik. And so I think that sat in a very deep part of him, even after he succeeded and gained, you know, that seat at the table and the respect of the religious community. I'm in a really privileged position that I'm not starting anything from new. I'm continuing something strong that my father built. Um, and I haven't had, not only have I not had any controversy, um, but we've seen historic partnerships. One example of that is um, over Corona, the government of Israel came to the fellowship and said, uh, you have you are the only organization that's able to quickly distribute basic needs to the population of Israel, all populations in every single city. Um, could we give you a grant and you'll distribute it? So basically the government had the Ministry of Welfare, had the budget, they were able to allocate the budget, but they weren't able to quickly distribute not just the money, like grants to people, but a single mother who needs a refrigerator that it broke. The government doesn't have a process in order to quickly do that. Or an elderly couple or a single person whose electricity is about to get cut, shut off to pay their electricity bill. And the fellowship has all that infrastructure to be able to do it. So that relationship that we tested out in the beginning of Corona around two years ago has grown uh, to now in 2022. The fellowship is part of the National Food Program or with the government of Israel matching. We've, um, uh, we have a $2 million program to provide uh, uh, baby formula to the poorest families with babies. Um, over 30,000 families who receive food packages and food aid there's no food stamps in Israel. So this is the first national food program together with Kolel Chabad, Leket, Latet, and some others. And uh, as far as the basic needs program, it grew so much that this year we signed a three-year contract with the government that the government of Israel is giving the fellowship 40 million shekel a year to distribute in the form of basic needs in every single city in Israel um, uh, in order to provide, you know, that broken fridge, a uh, new fridge to the single mother, or electricity to the elderly couple, or a new bed to a child who's broke to the new olim. Um, so in every single city in Israel now, Bedouin, Druze, Arab, Jewish, Haredi, all of them, the fellowship is distributing basic needs on behalf of the government of Israel. You must have a tremendous infrastructure with people on the ground. How, how many people are on the ground in Israel distributing the support? So last year, we helped over 2.1 million Jewish people in Israel, former Soviet Union, and around the world. And we have a staff of 70 people. So we very much believe in both technology and also partnership. So we work with the infrastructure that's ready set up on the ground. So the municipal social workers are our partners. They're ready there. They have all the information. They know the people who are uh, struggling. They know the single mother whose refrigerator broke. They're there on behalf of the government. They have all the, to name all the data that, that they need in order to confirm that this family really is the family that's most in need for this product. They go and visit. And then the fellowship has a system that they're able to apply, put in the information, give us all of the kind of required um, uh, details. And within 24 to 48 hours, that family will receive not the money, but the actual product that they need. So we distribute over 3,000 uh, products to the poorest families a week. And it's all through 70 staff members who, who work on amazing technology in this area of partnership. And I'm not sure you're going to be comfortable with this. So I apologize even for the- I love those questions. Yes. But you're a woman who's a CEO of a major corporation. Are there- other women in roles such as yours within the Jewish world who do such amazing things? Um, that's not an uncomfortable question. That's a very, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, uh, people ask me all the time, what's it like being a woman in a uh, executive position? Have you faced, you know, hardships and being and not only my woman, I'm, I'm under 40, I'm young. <laughs> and, um, the truth is for me, the biggest challenge hasn't been that I'm a woman. It's been kind of the the blessing and the challenge of that Eckstein name, you know, that for a long time, I felt like people um, said, oh, she's, she's, she got this position because she's Rev Eckstein's daughter. She got this position, she moved to it. And I know as we're burying my father, um, when he suddenly died three and a half years ago, there were many organizations who were meeting at you know, even before he was buried, trying to figure out how are we going to take over the work of the fellowship? How are we taking over the donors? Um, and so I think it's more because people didn't think that I was capable 
but rather I was just my father's daughter. So I came into this uh, position. I've never felt anything in uh, being a woman, any difference or treated differently. And if there are other women in senior um, executive positions of large organizations, um, I'm going to, I'm going, yes, JDC, Ariel Zwang. Uh, so there is, and saying that it's not difficult and not in the Christian community, is there uh, is there any kind of concern of uh, a woman getting up? You know, obviously in segments of the Jewish community, it would be there is sometimes that they say, we don't want a woman giving the speech. Do you find that sometimes in the Christian community? I think maybe that's one area it's a little bit easier in the Christian community. <laughs> <laughs> but um but no i you know i think a lot of a lot of times everyone has their own individual experiences and challenges and and things that they've experienced in life that that lead to their world view i've never felt neither in the jewish nor the christian community that i was um, not given an opportunity because i'm a woman maybe it's because i always say the way my incredible mom probably many of your viewers know my mom, Bonnie Eckstein, she sent me the invitation and she's like, oh my gosh, you're going to be on, <laughs> on Rabbi Matinky's <laughs> podcast. Um, so uh, I think my mom and my dad did an incredible job. You know, we're three girls, three daughters, and and my parents never said you could do anything, even though you're a woman. It was so even like when you're told that you, it, it's saying there's going to be challenges, maybe you can't, They it was just always a given. You could do whatever you want. Like it was never, even though you're a woman or despite the fact that you're a woman, it was just, you could do anything and you will do everything. So um, I remember my father always wanted my mom to um, make kamotzi and do all the different, you know, things in Judaism that that's um, halachically allowed uh, to show also the girls that there's a place in Judaism for you. Um, so I, I think maybe it's because I wasn't raised with that, um, uh, idea that I won't succeed or I will have challenges in being a woman. Maybe it's because I never had that instilled in me that I just don't see it. And so I was able to blaze through any of the challenges that would have otherwise existed. And what's the next thing on the, the horizon for the fellowship? You have grown it almost double in size since you've taken over. Do you just see it following the same path or do you see new things that are going to develop? Um, I, I always want to be on a trajectory of growth. Bezrat Hashem, according to our uh, strategic plans by 2024, we hope to hit 300 million donors um, and uh, $300 million and around 900,000 donors. Um, I think what we're doing is more than uh, the money and is more than the programs and is more than the people that we're helping. I think we're this grassroots voice of uniting Christians from all different polit political spheres to say, we stand with Israel. It doesn't matter if you're a uh, Republican, if you're a Democrat, if you're a conservative, it, what the fellowship's voice is, is we stand with Israel. We want to protect Israel. We believe, believe Israel has a right to exist. And maybe we're the only platform right now that's able to express that voice without having some political agenda connected to it. And so just to continue to grow it, but when I think about a million Christians in a couple of years, who will be supporting the fellowship, that's a million Christians who are also supporting Israel. Yes. How many of them are in the United States? Oh, um, around 90% of them. So uh, most most of our donors are in the United States. In Canada, uh, this year also around three years ago, we were raising $11 million. This year we're raising $15 million. So we're also on a growth trajectory in Canada. And so I think it's always a matter of... Um, giving people the opportunity to stand with Israel without uh, any of the politics around it. You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes maybe that the Hasbara of Israel has made is that we try to get people to stand with Israel because we are democratic, because we're free, because we have the most um, uh, righteous army and soldiers that, that that operate according to the highest values. And I, I, I agree with all that. But the problem is, the second then a soldier makes a mistake, or the second we're not as free, or the second there is a 
issue between the Jews and the Palestinians, suddenly that opens up the question, does Israel have a right to exist? That I think the, the platform for support for Israel for Christians and Jews alike is a spiritual platform. And then, of course, we have to be free and democratic. We have to be free for all. We have to give equality to all of Israel's citizens, where over 20% of our citizens are minority. We have to try to make peace with our neighbors and treat them um, uh, justly, even during times of war. But that's not our reason for existing. Our reason for existing is because this is our biblical homeland from thousands of years ago. We had, we, Israel was the center of the world. I mean, when you put together um, all the years that the Jewish people were in Israel before this modern era, it was over a thousand years. And then you look at America. How old is America? 500 and... Oh, no, no, way down. Or, so, way down even. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, so I'm definitely not an American history expert, but, but just to kind of put in context of how long the Jewish people were here between the first temple and the second temple. And, and so I think that um, the context of standing with Israel for Jews and Christians like has to be this spiritual connection to the land, whether you're identify as religious, orthodox, ultra orthodox, you know, secular. Um, I think this idea of a spiritual connection to the land is something that's critical in the narrative and definitely in educating the next generation of Christians. Yeah, Ellie, you've done an amazing job. It's uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, the young lady I knew in high school has <laughs> so very much. But you have, and you continue to do so. We're very proud of the things you've done, and we wish you only the greatest of success. And as you can tell, our time is up. And so I just thank you for this half hour. It was enlightening and enjoyable, and I wish you the best. And I uh, continue to, to hope that you will succeed, do great things, and that you give a lot of nachos as well to your mother, who we cherish, and to the memory of your father, Zal. Thank you so much for being part of this, this show today. Thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you. Bye-bye.